All right, welcome everybody. Um, sorry, I'm running a little late here. There seem to be some technical issues on my end here. So I'm trying to figure out what is happening here. Um, I, what I want to, it looks like everything is appearing properly. Um, it's just something in, in YouTube studio right now is, is showing everything as being cropped and I just wanna make sure everybody can see everything before we get started. So I'm just double checking that. It looks like everything is good now, but welcome. If you do notice anything off technically, let me know. Feel free to, to call that out in the chat. I, my name is Scott Meyer, I'm with Artist Network and this is Drawing Together. I love seeing everybody here. Um, a lot of familiar names and faces so let me finish getting set up here. Something's, something's a little wonky in, in YouTube today, so I'm hoping that it's not gonna be too much of an issue as we get going. Um, so this is what we're working on today. This is this beautiful portrait. Uh, as you all know, you know, this is, uh, portraits are, are more challenging, but I have to say I feel far more confident with them now after doing uh, you know several of these and after doing this this whole drawing together series. That's really what this was all about. It's about getting together, um, drawing together, sharing our experiences, and um, creating a, a weekly kind of dedicated practice to improving our drawings. And that's it's. I'm starting to see some of the results uh, in there because I'm feeling a little bit better. There's still some things that we can work on here. Um, if you are new, you're gonna to wanna to know that you can find the reference image in the description below. I also pinned a, um, a link at the top of the chat here so when you're, you're done with your drawing, you can share it with everybody at Artist Network. Uh, I love seeing all the drawings and there have been some amazing uh, pieces here. So uh, I'm glad everything seems to be showing up okay. Um, all right, so right now I have the reference image up on the left. I also have it kind of projected in front of me, kind of a small scale version of it. Um, and I'm working on a smooth sheet of nine by 12 paper today. Um, this is the, the Hanamula uh, paper that I've been using through a, a, a lot of the, the episodes for the series. It's just a smooth white drawing paper. Um, I have chosen to use the Derwent Onyx pencils again today. I just really like these materials. So <laughs> I, I guess if you have charcoal, you could work with that or any other medium. I'd love to see how you kind of uh, build this uh, using whatever materials you prefer. Um, I have the medium and the dark um, onyx here. If you have a regular set of graphite pencils, that'll work as well. Uh, I just, I like these kind of softer ones. It's just kind of my personal preference and it shows up better on the, uh, the screen here. Uh, for my erasers, I've got my, my handy kneaded eraser. I've got this retractable, uh, rubber eraser um, and then also have my Tombow Mono Zero for some of the details if I need that. And with this rubber eraser I have it kind of carved down into this chisel tip so that I have a little bit more precision there. And last but not least my trusty blending stump that has been well used and is starting to <laughs> starting to give me a little uh, trouble there. Um, but it's going to work out just fine for this uh, for this episode here. So um, Hello everybody, we got people from all over the world joining us. Um, again, I love seeing the, uh, all the familiar names here. Uh, Zephy is using the Prismacolor, uh, the Prisma Ebony pencil that's very similar to the Derwent Onyx. They're very soft. I really like them. Uh, so nice, I look forward to seeing how yours turn out. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to, to call it out in the chat. I'm gonna do my best to uh, catch everything as they come through. But if I miss something and you really want me to answer it, just feel free to type it again. If it's in all caps, I'm more likely to see it. So you might try that as well. Um, and I love hearing all of your um, kind of responses to questions. That's what this is all about. It's about sharing our experiences as, as artists. And so you may have a different response and you may, you may approach drawing differently than I do. And, and that's what is awesome about this. So feel free to share any of it. It's all good here. Um, Let's see, I thought there was a question that came in. I just want to just double check. Oh, uh, Romari, is any grain on your paper or is it totally smooth? So this, there is a bit of a tooth to this. So it's not like a, like a Bristol board, kind of really smooth illustration board. It's as a, just a kind of a smooth drawing paper. Um, let's see, I'm trying to see the, yeah, this is 90 pounds. So it's fairly heavy, it's acid free, which is nice. And it's a nice kind of cool, bright white. And to kind of give you a sense of the tooth, you can kind of see it in these areas here um, in this preparatory drawing. 
Um, so yeah, this is one that I worked on last week after our previous episode to try to prepare myself for this um, and think through some of the issues and the approach that I want to take to it. Um, this one, I really wanted to focus on getting the main kind of the masses of light and shadow right first and not get hung up on the details. And that's something I always uh, have struggled with when uh, working with portraits. I just naturally, I just want to get in there and start doing the, the, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, get those details in there because that's what's so much fun. Um, and then I often get to that point before I've really established a solid foundation. So my intent here is to stay focused on building the large structure first and getting those major values, the major masses established. And then hopefully at the end, just bring in a few key details to pull everything together. So um, as you can see down in this area, this is all very loose, um, this area down here as well. And then bringing a sharp detail and focus in just, just a few areas uh, in, the feature, in the facial features to bring us into that. Um, so that's kind of my general thinking and that's hopefully what I'll be able to demonstrate here. Um, I'm very nervous about this one for some reason. So be kind, you're all an awesome uh, group here to draw with. So I've never had to worry about that, but just throwing it out there. Um, let's see. All right, looks like everybody's ready to go. So I'm gonna grab my medium onyx um, and with this initial gesture, I'm just using an overhand grip, you know, holding it. You can see how far back I'm holding this. You know, I'm really um, you know, pulling back on this so that I, I um, have very little pressure applied to this uh, the pencil and I'm and I want to use the side of the pencil so it allows the the material to kind of float on the surface and can and start to kind of encroach on the uh, you know encroach on the values a little bit more kind of subtly I don't want lines in this one this is all going to be about building this out of the atmosphere and I'm looking with kind of blurred vision at the at the subject. I'm trying to just see it as one big kind of mass. Uh, and as you're as you're doing that, um, you know this this initial pass is all just about getting material on the page, creating that initial gesture, that initial reaction to the subject, and getting a feel for it, um, and then having information on the page uh, that you can react to. So, um, this isn't about getting it 100% accurate, but it's about building up these major areas first. There's something underneath there. I wonder if I can get that out real quick. I've got two sheets of paper. Let's see if I can do that. I don't know if that's gonna really help, but um, yeah, there's, you could see it starting to build up some of those dark spots, but if I can't get rid of them, that's all right. I'll show you how to work around them. So I'm just thinking about the major areas of light and dark. And as you can see, I'm trying to visualize the, the larger shadow shapes, not the, uh, you know, not breaking it apart by you know, head, hair, shoulders, etc. Trying to see it all as one shape as much as possible. Um, and what I like about this reference photo is this this play between light and dark. And we talk about that a lot in this series when working with the subject is to to really look at how the relationships between value um, fluctuate throughout the composition. So if you look on the left here in the reference photo, it's slightly lighter in value than the dark hair. Then we get into the light highlights on the, the face, and then it's that's lighter than the background here. So we have a dark, light, dark, light sequence. And so that's really what I'm trying to connect with at this point. And as I look for these major masses, I'm starting to think about um, positive and negative space as well. And trying to um, trying to look at not just the the shape of the head, but the shape of the space around the head. Sorry, I got a little consumed there by some of those thoughts. 
and I'm going to lightly sketch in where you know the eyes might go but I'm intentionally using the side of the pencil so I, I can't give myself any detail Trying to keep the trying to keep the, the, the marks varied here. And if as I'm using this overhand grip, I'm gradually kind of rolling the pencil in my fingers. Oh man, there's a lot of these little spots under here. But I'm just gonna leave them for now. We'll work around it. Maybe it'll end up being an interesting effect. So what that is, they're just tiny bits of must be eraser you know, residue from previous drawings that when I when I wiped down the table, I didn't do it thoroughly enough. And so now I have these these little high spots. Um, and I'm going to start to become a little bit more precise on this edge. You know, as we could start to form the right side of the head. And I haven't really applied any sort of comparative measuring, any sort of um, evaluation tools, but we'll get through that in a little bit. Um, I'll kind of go through what I, the, the things that I look for when controlling the proportions. Like I said, right now though, it's just a matter of laying down graphite, kind of getting rid of the white of the page and starting to think about those larger masses. Hello, Jerry's. Welcome. It's good to see you again. Everybody on the East Coast, hope you're staying warm, dry. I know those big nor'easters can be fun and challenging. <laughs> All right. So we're kind of getting into this mud head stage fairly early on. Um, and I want to keep, I want to stay on this, at this stage for, I think, for a little while. And so what I mean by that is like, it's, it's that view of the head as you're squinting at it, um, as the features kind of disappear and it just becomes like this, just kind of muddy. And we talk about that a lot in the series, the ugly duckling stage, right? So every drawing kind of goes through this stage where you feel like it's just going to, slip through your fingers and you're not going to be able to pull this together, but you got to keep at it and it eventually will. All right, let me, so what I'm, what I'm doing now is you could start to see the basic structure of the head and hopefully at this point you can recognize it as a person. There's something that's kind of deep in our, um, in our brains that's wired to um, make sense of faces and see them and we're trying to access that very early on in this drawing uh, and we can start to see that already just by having these two faint dark marks here we start to see them as eyes uh, I want to start to identify where the base of the nose might go I'm noticing this, this kind of tangent here where the nose, the tip of the nose aligns with the outer edge of this cheek. So that'll be an interesting um, thing to, for us to, to deal with. Um, but you know, just with these, these few marks, we can start to recognize it as a person. And now the challenge becomes, how do we make it this person in particular? You know, what are the unique qualities of this model here that um, we can identify and then try to kind of extract as much power from that as possible and really make this drawing be about this person. So I'm really toning the page. I'm not worried about preserving whites, um, you know, because if you look at even the highlight areas, um, if you look on the cheekbone, for example, that's going to be the brightest white. That means that everything else is going to have some tone applied to it. So I'm not worried about um, you know, protecting any of the white of the page. This is all going to get covered. And then I'm going to erase out those highlights. Um, and I, you can see I'm kind of bouncing all over the page here. Um, I'm kind of just striking, making some notes, moving on, striking in another area, making some notes. And, and as I'm doing it, it's, I'm trying to 
kind of alternate between thinking about the positive space and the negative space. So I'm working on this basic structure of the sh shoulder here, for example, um, and I can think about the positive shape, the positive space of this blue shirt and her arm, and then the shape of that background. And now I can start to look kind of critically at the proportions. And how do I want to do that? Let me think. Mad moments go saying, I might get a spot on her face. Yeah, I know, I might end up, <laughs> one of these dark spots may end up over here. And I'll show you how to, how to manage that. You can kind of get around it. Um, it's probably not ideal, but this being an exercise, um, I'm not, I'm not going to stress about it and we'll see what happens. And so one of the things you start to notice in here, there's a transition from, you know, flesh to hair and it's a soft transition and, not, and kind of building into that transition, you have the transition from light into shadow. So what I'm trying to do now is to see, you know, is there a definable kind of shape and where is it more, more subtle? So down in here, for example, the shadow of her chin um, and then that, that shadow kind of cast on her neck, that becomes a clearer shape. Um, and so then I can start to, um, start to define that a little bit more. And as we come up here, then those shadow shapes become really subtle. So I don't want to, I don't want to make up a hard edge when it doesn't exist. And I'm trying to avoid using lines and hard edges. Um, and you may have a different approach to it. You may find it more helpful to actually create an outline. And so now I'm just looking at this general shape here, trying to see it as a as a general angle. And this is where you can use what's called angle sighting. So I'm aligning my pencil with the reference image and I'm aligning it with this right side of the, the cheek and, the, and down to the chin, carrying it over to then placing it on top of the drawing. So I have that right in front of me. I have the, the, the projection in front of me so I can see the drawing as it's vertical. And we can kind of block in that general angle. And now we can just, can, we're gonna work our way around the drawing, kind of making it a little bit more specific, more specific as we go. And then, um, and we're gonna to try to build this all up at once. Hello, everybody. Uh, Claude is saying to keep my colored pencil work clean a standard tool is a vacuum cleaner. That is a good suggestion. Yeah, with a colored pencil, and that's a tricky medium. Um, so one of the things that's really helpful for me is, is to have the reference and the drawing side by side. You know, with in my current setup here, it's difficult to do that. So I have my reference in front, then I have my drawing down here. But because of this camera above me, what's in front of me, this screen, then I'm, I'm looking at exactly what you're seeing. So I can see the reference and the image side by side. They're different scale, um, but they're, um, they're next to one another. So I can, I can see one, um, I, can, I, can, I can see them both at the same time. And I've talked about that a lot in this series as well, is that the idea that when you're drawing, it can be helpful to um, really get used to the idea of um, kind of working offset a little bit. So maybe looking at the reference image um, while I'm drawing and out of my periphery, uh, really observing what's happening. So I may be studying the reference, but being aware of the drawing at the same time. And that can be really tricky at first, but over time you'll learn how to um, how to manage those two. So it, it can, but that can be really helpful. Um, you know, so as I'm saying, I'm, I'm working on the back edge of uh, uh, side of her head right here, I can be focusing on the reference image of this line and I can see out of my periphery, 
or actually kind of what's on the screen, the, the, the direction of the movement, right? And, and that helps me to make sure that I'm, I'm getting the angles right. And now that I'm starting to see more of the head emerge, I can start to uh, look at the basic proportions. Um, I can look at the distance from the bottom, you know, the height versus the width, and then the placement of the eyes. There's a slight angle to the axis of the eyes. And here, what I'm doing is I'm just visualizing a plumb line. So placing the corner of this eye that's on the left, her right eye, um, it looks like that's directly above the, the outer edge of the nostril. And then if you continue that plumb line, plumb line down, it intersects the corner of the mouth. So the, mouth, the corner of the mouth comes over a little bit from that. So plumb lines are really helpful in connecting various elements in a drawing. Uh, and so to help see that, you may take your pencil, close one eye, take your pencil, and align it with the, the corner of the eye, and then just see how that, that path passes through the various elements of the, the drawing. And then, of course, angle sighting, again, is just looking at the general angle Looking at the general angle, in this case, it's of the nose. And again, I'm still using the, the side of the pencil because it, it keep, creates a softer mark. Uh, and it, it's a, kind of a less permanent mark. It gets me, gets me to think outside of this initial impulse to create kind of a finer detail and sharper edges. And so I want to start to kind of evaluate the overall proportions. And my eyes are still blurry. They're out of focus right now. And I'm trying to pay attention to what, um, what details, what disappears when I squint because then that's an indication that I don't need to make it as clear in the drawing. And it's just a matter of making a few notes, moving on, and then I'll come back around to the eyes and the nose. Um, but it's one of the things that I've kind of learned over time. And I, you know, I, I remember my, my professors talking about it as well as like it's so easy for things to distort as you focus on them um, and and I didn't quite get it until I got kind of older as I started to work on drawing and uh, really start to uh, hone the skills it, uh, you know you start to realize that you know I would spin my wheels I would spend hours working on just the eye or a nose only to find that they don't connect together properly you know the eye looked great the nose looked great but they didn't align and then as a result it was just a hot mess and so I, um, I've kind of forced myself to, to try to, to really kind of delay that gratification of getting into those details um, and instead uh, remain focused on getting the major forms right just because I've learned from that the, the, uh, the, uh, the alternative <laughs> to that, kind of focusing on those details has always just come back to bite me. So, and so one of the things that I found really helpful uh, in developing, you know, some of my portrait drawing skills is to try to sw shift the thinking to the spaces between the features. So essentially build the head around the eyes, build the head around the nose and the mouth and build into those forms um, and then build from those forms outward again. Kind of, so if you find yourself struggling with that, creating this, a portrait where you have the eyes and the nose and the mouth separate, kind of like a Mr. Potato Head, right? Where they just feel stuck onto a mask. Try to switch that thinking and really study the spaces between them and the structure between them. Uh, and that might be helpful for you. 
Uh, Cheryl is saying, I think of angles like the face of a clock. I'd love to hear more about that. I think I understand what you mean, but um, I'd be curious to, to, uh, to get your take on it a bit more. Uh, uh, Joaquin is a, um, saying, sorry I arrived late. I Don't you trace reference lines on the drawing? Like for example, the circle and the lines for the eyebrows and bottom of the nose and the, in the Loomis method. Um, I, you know, I certainly have done that. Um, for whatever reason, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> and I don't know what that is. And so I think, but yeah, that's, I think it becomes kind of a personal preference. And I think that's part of what art making is all about is, you know, people sharing their ideas and saying, hey, this is how I do it, kind of absorbing those to see how it works, but then also really evaluating, well, what, if, it, if it's not working for you, why is it? Um, and what happens to me when I try to map out the features linearly first is that I'm, I'm always off by a little bit. And, then I, and what I do is I it kind of traps me into a structure that's really difficult to navigate away from. So if I don't have those mapped out properly to begin with, then it's more difficult for me to adjust as I go and make the corrections I need to. Instead, I just, you know, I kind of trust those initial proportions and then find myself at the end saying, oh my gosh, that eye was just a little too big, or a little too small, too close together, etc." So I've started doing it this way um, trying to see just the larger forms first um, and then building the, the features into that. Here, as I, I'm going to start to map out the ear. So I'm feeling pretty confident about the ratio between the width and the height. Let me just do a quick comparative measurement. So I'm taking this width here. I'm using my pencil, holding it up in front of the reference image gauging, gauging a, a distance here, and I'm going to compare that to the height. And it looks like this distance here is equivalent to about that. Yeah, th so the chin, which may come down here, to about the eyebrow here. And so I just want to kind of double check that again. This might have to come in just a little bit. I kind of like this, the, where the ponytail starts is a nice landmark. Um, and as I come across, you can draw a horizontal guide that comes right across here and see where that path cuts through to make sure that that feels correct. But that's um, kind of getting back to that, that question about the, you know, the Loomis method, um, I would love to see you all kind of share your approach, you know, how you get into it. Um, and if you get stuck somewhere, where is it? What are the things that you work on? Um, you know, where do you, uh, where do you struggle? So those are, like I said, those are some of the things that I would struggle with the most is one, unifying all the features to make it feel like it's all part of one head and then also getting those proportions right. And so I found that um, I generally do better when I build a portrait this way. Um, so here what I'm doing is I'm looking at the, I've got the nose kind of roughly established. Uh, that, that mark right there is kind of bothering me. It's kind of throwing things off. So I've got the nose and it feels all right generally. I'm gonna have to make some changes, I think, to the, some subtle changes. Um, but I can take a horizontal guide and, and align that, compare that to the bottom of the ear. And so it looks like that bottom of the ear should end up right about here. And then align and compare that with some angle sightings to so take, take the angles from that earlobe. And also be aware of that negative space. So look at the shape of that dark hair around the ear. So I'm still using the medium, medium graphite. And let me see, I want to, I want to at least get a rough indication of the mouth, the placement of the mouth. Uh, 
Uh, so then I have, yeah, I have that as a landmark that I can react to. And then what that does is it establishes now, I can see the scale of the upper lip and the chin, and I can compare that to the, the reference. And I, right at this point, it feels all right. So I'm, I'm right now, I haven't double checked the proportions. I haven't used any comparative measuring to double check those. So I'm just going by how it feels. And you can see I'm trying to break the, the features down as a, as a, uh, a relationship. It's a, a combination of um, straight lines rather than trying to get the curve just right. Um, I want to take a bit of a break. I see some questions coming through. And I see, oh, uh, Cheryl, I wanna, I'm curious about your, um, uh, your comments about using the clock. So thinking about you know, 12, 1, 2, 3, et cetera as part of the angle sighting. So really kind of identifying that. Um, so if you're new to, to drawing, angle sighting is really, it's a, it's a way of using your reference and comparing the angles of your reference to your drawing. So if you have, if you have your reference in front of you, and this happens whether you're drawing from life or whether you're drawing from a photograph, close one eye, which flattens your depth perception, right? Um, hold your pencil over your, your reference and align it with the, the specific edge that you're trying to target. Um, and then try to visualize what that angle is. And if your drawing is right next to it, all you have to do is find an angle, swing it over, place it on top of your drawing, and you can see how the, the, the angles in your drawing align with the angles of your, your subject. So that can be really helpful um, because it can be really deceiving sometimes. You know, it, it, something will feel vertical when it's actually angled, or it feels angled when it's actually vertical. So we do a lot of weird um, things in our visual kind of system that we have to combat. And, and so using angle sighting to double check things would be really helpful. Um, and then using that same method, you can create plumb lines. So those are just vertical lines that run through your drawing um, once you've identified, a, again, a target. So for example, I can use the inner corner of the eye, draw a plumb line down from it, visualize a vertical line that runs, extends above and below it, and see where that path, that line would pass through all the other features along that. So along that, that vertical line, what features it would intersect with it. You can carry that upward, for example, and you can see where that line would intersect the, the hairline or the, the, the forehead and make sure that, that, um, that it's represented accurately in your drawing. So for example, if my hairline was back here, I could see that there's something off that when you compare that eye to the hairline, then something needs to be adjusted. I either need to move the eye over or I need to bring that hairline over. But using that plumb line, it gives me a point of reference. And you make your way through the drawing by making those connections. And so my, my goal right now is to try to make as many connections as possible between things and focus on the relationships between things rather than the absolute form of each of the elements. Yeah, and the, then the, the theory is, is that it's, if, I, if I remain focused on those relationships, then the features and those individual elements will come together more, more quickly. So we'll see how that works. Um, all right. Uh, mad moments go, good observation and key measure make a good picture. That's, I think that's a good, uh, good uh, statement to make there. I totally agree with you. Um, space gallery, I just started with pencils, loving it. Push paint for 20 years, awesome. Learning methods, any noob suggestions? For those of you who are new to drawing, um, what would I suggest? I, I'd be curious to see what you all suggest as well. I'm gonna try to think about, I guess the, the thing that I've, the exercise that I found the most helpful for myself and I like to recommend to students is to keep a sketchbook for gesture drawings. So kind of really quick, you know, 30 second, maybe 60 second long, quick gestures of things that you're observing from life, whether that's people or whether that's objects uh, or places. Um, 
but do a lot of quick drawings. Um, and I find that that's ultimately more valuable than fewer, more extensive drawings. Um, if you have the time to do both, that's even better. So if you have the time to be sketching all the time as well as working on a, a more lengthy kind of studio piece, that's probably the best. But if time is limited and you had to choose, I would say work on lots of gestures because in those gestures, you're dealing with a lot of the key issues that are um, inherent in drawing, proportion, movement, form, shape, composition, all of those, but you're doing it very quickly. So you get a lot of drawing done in a short amount of time. Um, whereas with more finished works, um, a lot of what eats up the time are the details um, that may not actually be um, you know, quite as valuable um, in the end. So, but I, I, at the same time, I think it's, you know, that's, that's really my take on it. And you may all have, you all may have kind of a different perspective there. Yes, Cheryl saying, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain is a, that is a fantastic book. That has been around since, since the seventies or so. That is a, a really a classic. Um, I think books are, are really helpful. I'm working on one myself. Um, but you know, really what it comes down to is drawing and drawing with intention. Um, and then the, with the intention of improving, not necessarily perfecting. And so what I like to remind people is, is that, you know, it, it, be aware of what's working well and what you're struggling with. You have to identify both of those. That's what moves you forward. Once you've identified what you've done well in a drawing, you're more likely to repeat it. And if what you've, if you're, identifying what could be improved, then that gives you a target for the next one. Um, and that's the, the whole um, kind of goal for this series is to just, we're just practicing. This isn't a finished work that I'm going to be hanging up somewhere. This is all designed to just improve my skills of you know value control, shape, composition, proportion, things like that, build up my hand-eye coordination. Um, and you know, I, I like to say, you know, this isn't, this isn't the only drawing we're ever going to do. So if you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself to make this one drawing be representative of your, your skill set, then you're kind of, you're opening the door to dissatisfaction. You've got lots of drawings you're going to be doing in your life. This is just one moment that we're capturing. I'm gonna. This is this is gonna be really tricky in here, <laughs> with the with the uh, preparatory drawing I did. That was also tricky. Um, something seems off here. I've, here's what I want to do. What do I want to do? All right. Oh, I need to. I need to wipe this down. So I've got just a paper towel. Blending this down. I kind of like these dark spots that are here. Um, Sometimes they really bug me, but I don't know. I, I kind of like that they're kind of floating around here. So that's, that was something that was not intended. It was just poor management on my end when I was laying out the paper. I didn't properly clean the surface. So, um, But what I like to do, about kind of when I wipe this down, what I really like about it is that it helps unify it. So um, really all design, all art is about the the relationship between variety and unity. The greater the difference, the greater the contrast, the more exciting it's gonna be, um, but you move away toward, from the, that sense of unification. The more unified it is, um, then potentially it becomes boring. And so you try to find that, that right balance. And um, so as we start to define these forms, each form is a division on the page. And the, um, by wiping everything down, it helps to kind of tie everything back together and then we're going to fracture it, and then we're going to tie it together, fracture it, and go from there. So I'm using this kind of circular mark, because I don't want strong directional marks here, and I'm just thinking about this overall shadow shape. Um, if that's a term that you're not familiar with, shadow shape, when we're, when we're thinking about light and shadow structure, there are three main terms. There's 
there's the form shadow, there's a the cast shadow, and then there's the shadow shape. So the form shadow is the shape of the shadow that's on the form of the object. So in this case, there's a form shadow here on her, her jawline here. That jaw is also casting a shadow. So when we look down at the neck, that's a cast shadow. Um, but there's also a form shadow in the neck, so it's rolling into that shadow over here. You bring those all together as one form, and that's the shadow shape. And my emphasis right now is on the shadow shapes and unifying those elements um, rather than distinguishing between the cast and the form shadows now. And, and that's all, again, all in the service of um, unity, holding everything together. How are we doing on time? We're about 45 minutes in. I'm feeling good about the time. And as I'm, as I'm working, I have to remind myself to keep rolling the pencil so I don't develop these flat spots. Um, if anybody sees anything that looks um, significantly off in terms of the proportions, please let me know. You know, I kind of welcome those observations. So if you're new and it feels like people are criticizing me, just know it's okay. <laughs> Everybody's cool here and we're just sharing our observations. And so you could say, hey, you know, that, that eye looks too high or too low. Um, you all have helped me through drawings many times. And so don't hold back. You know, if you say, hey, that looks like crap, that doesn't help um, and it hurts my feelings. But if you say, hey, that eye is in the wrong place and it needs to be somewhere else, then that's a very valuable thing. And so when you find uh, uh, an artistic partner who can give you the feedback you need, that is really valuable. Uh, so, and then hopefully that person has a, has a mindset that is um, supportive. So, and you are all that supportive community. So, um, let's see. Aaron Bell, I also appreciate people talking about the ugly stage of art. Awesome. Yeah, we talk about that a lot here, the ugly duckling stage. This is this is going to be in the Ugly Duckling stage for a while. Um, but after a while, you start to really like it, right? You know, you look forward to it because you know that there's something good that's going to come out of it. So um, let's see. I used to give up when I got to that point because I thought I had ruined it already. And that has helped me press through it. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear it, Aaron. Thank you for sharing that. Um, awesome. Space Galleria. I'm glad you're here. Oh, uh, uh, Claude is asking, when I'm wiping down, am I using much pressure? I am not really, um, but I will at some point. Like if I really feel like I need to like smooth out an area, I am paying, kind of paying attention to the pressure and I may have to kind of really bear down in order to kind of smooth out a spot. At this early stage, I don't really need it. Um, but this is it's a, something I also do in painting. My oil painting is kind of building it up, scraping it down, building it up more, scraping it down. Um, and uh, so you might find it helpful in other areas as well. And I'm not using the, the blending stump at this point um, because I kind of I'm saving that forward uh, for later. I'm going to switch to the dark. Um, I'm just going to go right for it because I'm feeling more confident in these larger masses, and I feel like I can start to um, start to define things. So what am I? What do I need to do here? Um, Okay, I'm feeling, I'm feeling good about the overall scale on this side. What I'd like to do now, I think, is, is to really define that. So I'm going to work on that background and kind of work up to that edge. Um, so rather than starting on the edge and working out, it's kind of like moving back and forth in and out of that edge because I want to avoid a hard line along there. Um, that can flatten things out. And for me, um, it's one of those areas that I've always struggled with is creating that sense of depth. There's a plane like uh, the, that it angles away from us. If you if you look at the, the plane that the the eyes and the cheekbone are on, you know it angles away from us. So I want to bring this forward and push that back. If I drew a hard edge along here, there's a chance that it's going to pop up. Um, so 
I need to be really kind of careful along that. And it, you can have it be a sharp edge, but um, pay attention to the, the contrast there. If it's a hard line, um, it can sometimes flatten things out. Um, but this is where, like, this is when I look at, like, Sargent's work, and he'll do that. He'll put, like, a just a beautiful line along that edge, and he doesn't lose the depth in the structure, and it it's really kind of inspiring to see that. Um, but it's just something I kind of think about. So, so just kind of pay attention to what's happening along that, that edge there. And so what I'm using this kind of modified overhand grip. So I wedge the pencil in my fingers and then I can stabilize it with uh, my fingertips. And then I can just roll my hand up to give myself a little bit more precision when I need it. Uh, and then drop it back down to utilize the side. So I don't have to, have to actually change my grip in order to go between kind of an overhand and then a tripod grip. So I'm just looking at, as I follow along this edge, trying to respond to the, the areas that feel like they have a sharper edge to them. And then try to just target those areas. I don't really know what's happening in the eye, so I'm gonna let that, I'm gonna let that sit for a little bit. And if you're trying to create kind of a smooth area, a smooth transition, as you build up your layers, um, what I like to do is, you know, kind of target the, the light spots, kind of fill them in, and then try to feather it out. So if I kind of have a dark spot here, dark spot there, if I want to smooth that out, then I just try to find, try to build in that area between it, and then feather it out. And that can happen along that, that edge. I'm, I'm kind of in a danger zone right now because um, if, if I could rotate the paper right now, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd be able to change the direction of my marks more easily. What I should be doing is running these marks here more horizontally. Um, so, and then in a subtle way, what that does is it creates a differentiation between those horizontal marks in the background and then that mostly vertical edge of her, her jawline and her, and her cheekbone. If I run these marks parallel to her features, to her, that side of her face, then um, there's a chance that that background area will pop forward or visually will attach the two together. We'll say they belong together. When they don't, that background is actually you know, farther away. So I need to pay attention to the direction of my marks. Um, that can sometimes make the, all the difference in the world in a drawing. You may get the values 100% right, but just by changing the direction of your marks, it can um, open up the space in your drawing. And right now, I'm really just, this whole drawing, I've only been using the, the the pressure of the pencil, just the weight of the pencil, I'm not applying a lot of pressure to it. Um, Cheryl is saying, you have an art friend that you rely on. That's good. Yeah, you know, it's hard. We've talked about that before in this series. We'll often um, kind of put pressure on, you know, people in our lives to give us feedback. And it, it's hard. There's a lot of people that, that have spent very little time studying art um, and understanding how art is made, and they can feel kind of put on the spot to make make a comment, and uh, or they'll have like an impulse, but they don't really know how to articulate it. So being able to define uh, feeling, it takes some time and practice, and so that's why you know I you know the, sometimes I just there's some people that I don't I don't burden with the the um, uh, you know, the pressure for feedback. But sometimes I like that feedback. I want that honest initial re uh, reaction to things. And so I just try to put that into context. Um, you know, somebody says, you know, I don't know why, but I just don't like it. 
you know, maybe there's something there that we can help them articulate that will end up being useful. But like I said, there's nothing that, nothing like having somebody who really can identify what they're responding to and then articulate that effectively in a way that you can then process into your own work. So, um, so slowly coming together. What am I doing now? Okay, I, this, um, I want to I want to keep working down on this side here. Do I feel good about uh, the lips? I think that's what I want to. I'm going to try. I'm going to do a little bit of outlining around the lips here, so I can identify that there's so much going on in that area where you can see just a small triangle of her cheek there, um, and. That's one of those small areas that I think is going to um, play a big role in us being able to interpret the specific angle of her her face. Like you imagine, if that little spot wasn't visible, it be it, it could be more confusing. Um, so it, it's it's a kind of a I, I think it's a one of those little details that may be important. So I'm going to put that in there. Um, so yeah, so I kind of outline things a little bit, but I'm trying to just use the pressure, the weight of the pencil to keep these marks light. I don't want to emboss the paper and I don't want to create a line that is difficult to erase later in case I need to move things around. And I'm starting to get kind of dark along that edge. I need to, I need to bring these kind of a horizontal movement to this background here. And as I get away from the facial features, I feel like I can be a little bit more um, open with the use of line. Again, that's something that I would, you see in like Sargent's work or Degas. It's just this beautiful use of line in just the right spot. And Cheryl's saying, yeah, when I take a picture of it and rotate it, sometimes I can see my problem. Yes, that's a really good um, tool to use. And that, that kind of comes out of that drawing on the right side of the brain. Um, the term I use here is to change the context of your drawing. You're changing the relationship between you and the drawing so that you can see it perhaps in it with fresh eyes. And so yeah, holding it up, looking at it from a distance, holding it upside down, um, looking in the mirror, taking a photo and just observing the thumbnail. Those are all effective ways at recontextualizing uh, the drawing as it relates to you so that you see it, you know, fresh. Yeah, because we, it's kind of the nature of focus. As we focus on something, it starts to distort in our mind. We, that's, that's what focus is, is right, you, you, you pick an area, everything else around it shuts down. And as we get absorbed in specific features, or um, we kind of lose that ability to, to see the, the forest for the trees. All right. Um, uh, sad potato. I think her nose seems to be upturned while in the reference photo it points down more. Yes, that is a very good observation. I completely agree. Thank you. Um, so now the question is, is the nostril right and I bring this down or is this right and I bring the nostril up? And I think, I think I need, I think the nostril is in the right spot. So I'm going to bring this down, and if it's not, then we'll see what happens. Uh, so I'm going to kind of just kind of shore up that a little bit, and then I'm going to try to look more specifically at this angle here. Um, and then for me, with noses, uh, I, I try to 
try to see it as a series of just abstract shapes. Those are weird forms, right? <laughs> like, those are hard to draw, um, but I found I've, I've had greater success when I stopped thinking about them as noses and all those kind of preconceived ideas of how to draw one. Um, it, I, if I try to get rid of all those then, uh, and I just see it as, a, as an abstract form, I, I tend to do better. Um, I'm gonna, I need to clean this up a little bit in here. So I'm gonna use my eraser. Um, so you can kind of start to see along the nose. There's it's, it catches a little bit more light along the ridge. So you get these you get these highlights at the turn. So right here at the brow, and then right at the tip is where it gets brightest. And you can see that in this reference photo. And then I'm just going to draw with the eraser a little bit to help map out the forms. So looking at the highlights and I'm just trying to see how things are starting to shape up. So while I'm, while I'm correcting some of the lines that I need to have disappear, I'm also trying to contribute to the form. So it's not just about erasing out marks that I don't need anymore. It's about adjusting the form. I wonder if I got that downturn of her nose as effectively. I think I might need to come up a little bit in here. All right. Um, Romero saying, drawing a nose is like molding clay. Yes, I'd love to hear more about what you mean by that. I think I think I see what you what you're talking about. It is there is something very sculptural about it. Um, I guess that's true with really all portrait drawing or drawing in general. Uh, but I'd be curious to know more. So I'm just going to kind of erase this highlight here. And what I'm trying to do is visualize, you know, there's their hot, it's kind of the hot spot the highlight is, right? And it, it creates this path that curves and that's really ultimately what's, what's creating that form and structure. Um, and so I'm trying to visualize this path here um, and um, because that ultimately kind of defines the turn as I talked about, you know, there's the general plane of the face, the eyes, the cheekbone, the mouth, they, there's one plane here, and then you make a turn around the cheekbone back towards the ear. And it's that, that, that highlight here represents that spot where the turn happens. And so this can be really helpful to try to map this form down here. It becomes a bit more subtle here. There's no real clear differentiation between the planes down in the, around the chin, but it becomes more apparent up in this area. And the other thing I want to be kind of observant of is a kind of a sense of fall off. The idea that, you know, because the under the nose, the, the mouth, the chin kind of wraps down underneath for the most part, generally the light is coming from above. You get brighter highlights, higher contrast in the forehead area. And as you come down, things just soften a little bit. You know, you get, you get kind of softer edges and it's kind of tucked under just a little bit. And so you, you have a slightly lower contrast there. Ah, Romero saying, what I mean is that you can block in a shape and then use the eraser and pencil to move the shapes around, like molding a block of clay. That's awesome. I totally get what you mean there. Um, that's a very kind of painterly approach to drawing, which is what I connect with, is trying to move things around on the page. 
Um, I love that analogy that you're, you're bringing up. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm gonna leave this ear in shadow. I'm gonna use the highlight. I'm gonna use the eraser to pull out the highlight there, but that's mostly in shadow. So what do I need to do? I need to, I'm trying to giving myself um, a bit of a break and I'm starting to, trying to strategize a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is work on an area that requires a little less thinking. Um, and that's kind of this darker area with the hair. Uh, while I while I kind of strategize a little bit, and I want to change out the direction of my marks so that I don't I don't have these strong directional marks to contend with. So as I'm doing this too, I'm trying to be mindful to, to create a soft edge along there. So I'm kind of lifting off as I as I go, just so I don't have a harsh sharp edge there. So how's everybody doing? Anybody following along? How is your drawing coming together? If you're new, um, you just know that you know, you'll know see uh, a URL linked at the top of the, the chat here. Um, and that, that will take you to a page on Artist Network where the, the episode page here where you can share your work. And so if, you, if you're not following along but you're curious what everybody else is doing, um, you can kind of you can check in on that page and see everybody's work. Um, and if you are following along, I'd love to see what you're working on. All right, and I'm gonna Okay, let's see. I'm gonna start to, I think what I wanna do is, is kind of start from this edge and work my way into the features. I'm gonna save the eyes and nose and the mouth for last. And I don't know why specifically. I think I'm just gonna do it. I think that's my, it's just an, a feeling. There's no real logic at this point. You know, because I have everything mapped out and I'm feeling pretty good about it, I could go right into the eyes, but I'm gonna wait and delay that gratification even longer. And for no other reason than it's just my creative desire. I wish there was some sort of educational component to that and saying, here's a reason for waiting to do the eyes, but no. I think I think it totally at this point because I'm feeling confident in the um, the overall structure. You know, I could you could go right into the eyes, the nose, and finish off those those details, those features. Just kind of feathering this out a little bit. It's interesting. I can see with the the glare from the lights here. Um, I didn't really notice kind of a blotchy. There's this kind of dark spot here that I didn't really notice. I can't really see from this point of view, but I see from the overhead camera. I just want to smooth that out because it's distracting. That that spot's distracting where these are, I don't know, for now, still somewhat interesting. Not ready to get rid of them. Okay. Um, Kathy, so that's a really good point, Kathy, saying noses are the only features that don't, it doesn't change the ex, with expression. Um, so it's like a clay shape, inactive. That's, it's a good, I mean, I suppose there are some, you know, you could flare the nostrils or something, but I, to, I see what you mean there. They're much less kind of expressive when you think about, the, you know, the subtle shift in the lips or squinting of the eye or something. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this ear off, I think. Let's see. So what I want to do, I want to get those dark shapes in first, and I'm going to race out the highlights. 
Um, so there's going to be some thinking back and forth between the positive and negative space. So looking at that dark shape around the ear, and be kind of adjusting there, trying to give that a little bit more structure. Um, and then looking for the shapes here in the inner part of the ear. These are really complicated forms, but if you just take your time um, and, um, and just kind of keep checking in with the overall proportion. So one thing that might be helpful is to identify the center of the ear and what's happening in the reference photo. What, what part um, of the ear are you looking at that's right in the center? Um, and then break that down even farther. And now look at this section, what, what's happening midway between this dark spot here, the center, and this like a quarter of the way down, what's happening. And kind of build your, your way through there that this way. So I'm just looking at these kind of abstract forms. And then just keep doing quick check-ins with a positive and negative space. So as I'm looking at this, I might be looking at the shape of the dark, you know, interior of the ear, um, but also trying to be aware of this shape here. And then when I go in and we'll erase out the highlights. And then also try to identify the areas where the edges are a little bit sharper. Let, let there be some variation there. So there's going to be some soft transitions, and then there's going to be some sharper edges. And what's really going to bring this to life is to have some nice variety there. Right, that's starting to come together. Need to give this a little bit some a little bit more structure in here. So I don't want to labor on this too much. As long as I get the overall feel of it, I'll be happy. Um, if I get the basic shape right and the basic scale, um, I want to kind of darken this area around it, around that ear. And using it when I don't know what direction to make my hatch marks, I just go to a circular mark. It's a bit more kind of ambiguous, unless you unless you know for sure you want marks to run in a specific direction. So I'm using this kind of overhand grip, but I'm really starting to apply more pressure now. I'm still trying to use the side of the pencil. I don't want to use this, the tip of my pencil. I don't need to, I don't need that, that sharp point. I just need to, I need to cover a large area and I can apply more pressure here. All right, let's see. How's that looking for shadow? I'm, I'm gonna, actually, I'm not quite sure I want to erase out the highlights right now. I, I kind of feel like I need, now that I darken this, I think I need to, um, I need to evaluate the, the, the value. I need to make sure I'm dark enough first before I start to erase out any highlights along that ear, because I don't want that ear to pop out of the shadow. It needs to, it needs to be in the shadow on the side of her head. And then just a few little highlights here to where it's, it's catching the light. Kind of leaving this edge a little bit soft right now. Um, I'm focusing on bringing this forward, you know, pushing that side of the head back. And if I squint my eyes, I can see which edges kind of disappear 
and that's where I can soften the transitions a little bit more. Yeah, I think I need to um, yeah, I think I, I don't think I need to bring out the highlights much. I want to be really careful here. All right. So you can see what I did there. It was just a kind of wiping it down, unifying it, now going back in and sharpening the edges again. Um, this is, I'm really glad I chose this medium today using this graphite. Um, sometimes it's just a feeling, you know, I just feel like working with charcoal or I feel like working with graphite, but, and today I just feel like working with this. All right, so let me see what happens now. If I'm gonna take this mono zero eraser and I'm just gonna erase out this highlight in here. See if that gives it any form. There's a little bit of light right in here. So I'm trying to pay attention to the, the pressure on this as well. So it just starting with a light pressure, seeing what lifts. I'm making sure I'm kind of working in the right spot. And if I need to, I can bear down on it a little bit more, but yeah, that feels better. And then actually right in here, I need to... The values are tricky because we're constantly calibrating uh, in our minds. And so, you know, we'll uh, kind of lock into a, a light and dark value structure. And then you bring in an eraser and you pull out a highlight and it completely transforms everything. Um, all right. Yes, shout out to the model. Yeah, I wish I knew. I got this off of Pixabay. Um, Kathy is saying, do you sharpen your uh, pencil with a razor? I do. Um, it's not. It's certainly not an elementary question, but there's. I don't know if there's really a trick to it. Um, you know, it's really just having a sharp blade and coming in at a fairly shallow angle, and then when I, if I need to refine it more, I'll turn it this way and just kind of scrape it um, to kind of smooth it out. Um, but then that's one of the reasons I work with an overhand grip. So if I use the side of the pencil, it's generally just sharpening it at the same time. So then I always have a sharp point that I can um, rely on when I need to add a little bit more detail. So I'm gonna try to, darkening the hair, just to try to locate the back of the neck a little bit to see where it comes in just behind the ear, you know, and then the jaw comes out right here under the ear. But it's tricky. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna kind of work my way around now. So I wanna um, kind of establish this jawline. It's all very soft, very, very subtle. So I don't wanna overstate things and start to invent um, invent forms or shadows that don't really exist. Just kind of trust the abstract shapes, the abstract structure of light and dark. I'm gonna darken this in here. Let's see, I'm gonna, I just wanna like drop in the value here a little bit, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna be kind of finishing this, this part. I just need enough to, enough to establish this shoulder. I don't want it to be a, I don't want it to be a distraction. So just using the side of the pencil, just some quick gestural marks. They're not accurate, but I want it to be enough that we accept it as the shoulder and um, and then we go beyond it and we just go right into the head as that's the hope. Let me 
So you can start to, even though she has dark hair, you can see a bit of a contrast between light and shadow. So that's what I'm trying to visualize here. Let's figure out where that shadow really takes over. Where does the light come in? How's that work? All right. Is what, let me see what happens with this blending stump. I'm going to grab this. This should drop the value a touch because it's filling in those white spots that I'm not able to access with the graphite. So actually, this is this might be. See what happens now. I'm just going to I'm going to kind of keep working with this blending stump, kind of starting in this hair area, and do some drawing with it. And those of you who have been with me for a while know that, you know, I, I always rejected the blending stump. Um, and I really regret doing that for that long. I really love this as a drawing tool. But what clicked for me was when I really realized that it's not just about smoothing things out. It's an opportunity to contribute to the form. Um, and so once I started really drawing with it, then I'm like, oh, that's the power. It can create some really soft marks. Uh, that um, are great for um, especially addressing details um, because it, um, you know, when, you're, when we work with the, the, the pencil tip, it can create a more defined line that creates too much of a division on the page. And, um, and then it flattens out the, the, the space. So, okay, so I'm just looking at the, the overall shape. And so when I'm, when I'm working with a blending stump, I, I really use it the same way I would with a pencil. So I'm, I'm trying to pay attention to the where I'm applying the pressure along the, you know, each kind of mark that I'm making. So if I need to lift off or if I need to kind of land gently on the page, um, you know, vary the pressure um, as needed. And there's this really nice bounce light coming up underneath the chin that I want to address. And that should all be in shadow there. And then I'm just looking, trying to, trying to really assess this shadow shape in here. And one of the keys to working with the, the blending stump is to you know, keep rolling the, the material in your fingers, just like with the pencil, so that you're not getting kind of a dead spot in there. Kind of feather out the marks. Really kind of pay attention to the pressure control so you don't end up with blotches that you don't want. So I'm going to need to kind of evaluate things a little bit. So I'm looking at the drawing that's in front of me. It's equivalent to kind of stepping back from it. So if you haven't done that in a while, um, set up your drawing, look at it from a distance, you know, cross the room as best, and then kind of gradually walk up to it to see how things hold together. Because you'd be amazed that you may you know, work on a drawing and it looks great when you're up close, you step back from it and at 10 feet away, you can barely see it. And I've had that happen so many times. And so it can be helpful to, to kind of intentionally step away from it, look at it from a distance, um, and you'll, you'll see what needs to be addressed when you do that. And just double, I'm just gonna look at the, uh, the chat here real quick. See how everybody's doing. Sad Potato, I've been having a hard time with portraits, so I joined in. I think my main problem was trying to outline everything instead of focusing on value. Simplifying is good for zoomed out things, not up close. 
the, you know, there's some good observations. Um, and Claudia is saying, use a mirror from a distance to check proportions. That's awesome. Um, Uh, and then Daniel Vela, hello, I want to know why you put initially a graphite layer on all the surface of the paper, including the background. Well, I want, the, I want there to be a value in the background. That needs to be darker so that I can pull the highlights out. Um, and I find that it's helpful to tone the page and then we can erase the highlights out. It keys everything down in the drawing. Um, and so it allows you to give uh, the highlights a little bit more power. If I have too much white, if this background was too light in value, then you lose that contrast with the highlight. Right. And so that highlight is going to be really essential to creating depth and structure. And one of the things that I, I you know, I had kind of discovered about myself is that I, I would I just naturally would key things too light. And so I kind of have to force myself to, to drop the value down on things so that I can expand that value range, to ex expand that tonal range. So hopefully that makes sense. That's at least that's that's the way I do it. You know, there's going to be people here that have a different approach, but um, hopefully that articulates my thinking there. Okay. All right, back to the blending stump. I'm going to. I'm going to start to draw with a blending stump and try to get these features in. So I'm looking at the shape of the light and shadow. Um, and especially like in these creases. Kind of sneak up on the form a little bit. Um, I, need to, I need to establish what the angle is of that eye. So here, what I'm trying to do is try to, to try to create the the eye by looking at the shape of the light and the shadow, not by creating an outline and then filling it in, um, because especially with something that's this, this delicate, it can um, it can really overwhelm the structure. Uh, and so, I'm just trying to sneak up on it, be more subtle with the eye. This requires a little bit more focus, so I'm not speaking as much right now. It's going to pick up more graphite on this side here, switch to this other eye. And one of the things that I'm trying to remind myself to do is, you know, do quick check-ins. You know, so, you know, work both the eyes at the same time. So when it's, I'm making this mark, I, I kind of quickly check in where I am relative to the other one and try to see both of those at the same time. This is really a tricky shape here. Oh, well, there's an ugly duckling stage for you, right there in the eye. Um, all right. I'm gonna do some drawing with the eraser to try to establish this form a little bit more. Get, I think I need to get this eyebrow in indicated at some point. So yeah, don't forget to kind of keep checking in with 
with things. So it, it's really easy now as the focus starts to shift to the, the, the specific, to the details, it's easy to lose sight of the relationships between things. So this is where I'm starting to tighten up a little bit and um, I need to be more, um, I, I need to be more conscious about where, you know, like what the relationships are between the various elements and not get, um, not just assume that everything is, is correctly placed, um, that they get the correct proportions that I need to be willing to, to kind of adjust as I go. So I've got my, my Tombow eraser here and I'm using that to draw a little bit to establish some of these, um, you know, some of the, the, the finer elements over here. How's that look? Okay. I think, I feel like the general placement and the size is working okay for the eyes. Um, Thomas is saying, mine looks like a woman, just not this woman. That is, I totally get that. <laughs> Hopefully you're being kind to yourself because I have beaten myself up for exactly that same thing. That's why portraits are hard <laughs> because it, yeah, getting it to look like the person is, oh boy, that is the, that's it right there. Um, that's not easy. Um, uh, yeah, Kathy is saying, yeah, I use a box cutter to sharpen my pencils yeah, rather than kind of a straight razor blade. All right, so now I'm working on the eye. And this one over here is really, really fascinating because you're really seeing the, the ball of the eye. And what you see, excuse me, in the structure is that the way the, the way the ball sits in the socket and then the way the eyelids form over that ball is the sphere of the eyeball. The lower eyelid comes down underneath it a little bit more. The upper eyelid comes in over on top a bit more. And you can see that here. It's not perfectly centered. You don't have the upper and lower eyelids perfectly centered over the sphere. They're kind of, they're kind of rotated down a little bit. Um, and so really look at that shape. And the way that I um, help to manage that is to look at the negative space. Uh, so really the shape of the eye, the white of the eye here. Um, that can, that can be really helpful to, to use that. So I'm just going to, I'm going to block that in as a solid shape. And there's a highlight on it that I'll erase out with this little guy, this little Tombow. And then that was overstated. So now I can come back in and kind of clarify it a little bit more. Um, and then if I use my blending stump, I can soften that edge. One of the other things that I see happen a lot is an, uh, sharp, the, making the, the pupil and the iris too sharp. That transition into the white of the eye is usually actually a little bit softer than we initially think. And make it a little bit darker at the top. That's more in shadow. And you get the pupil right under here. And then what is happening here? Then you have the eyelid that wraps around. You have the eyelashes that curl up from it. Um, and so the way I, I work with the eyelashes is to drag the pencil. Using the side of the pencil, I'm dragging it out. Um, and you want to think about varying the marks. You know, it's not a perfectly spaced kind of even distribution of these marks. They kind of clump together. They have variation. And then this lower eyelid, this is really cool. So it's this, you know, thin line here, a few little lower eyelashes. When you, you could see it kind of wrap around and then there's this little triangle of white that where the light is catching on that lower eyelid. So you can see the, the thickness of the lower eyelid right in there. And so as I'm working on that, I want to be careful not to sh make that too sharp of an edge. I don't want to outline it. So I'm just using these soft circular marks around the outer edge, coming up from the, from the outside, working up to that edge. Um, and then it gets sharper right in here. And 
and then uh, that's that's really kind of a dark spot that I need to uh, I need to smooth out a little bit. Just need to feather that out so it doesn't become this kind of noticeable blotch back there. So just kind of feathering that out a little bit. That feels a little bit better, getting a little bit more detail into it now. How are we doing on time? We're about an hour and a half in. I think we'll be able to finish this up in about another 30 minutes or so. All right, so now I'm going to move across. Before I add the details in here, I just want to make sure that that axis feels right. Um, what do I want to do? Romero is saying the right eyeball is almost the shape of a diamond. Yes, that's a good observation. Um, yeah, it's really, really interesting shape when you look at this three quarter view. Um, and especially what I love is this shape right here as you have, you have the, the sphere of the eyeball and then the way these eyelids wrap around it, it, it results in essentially a a vertical line right at back in here. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Okay. So just these soft circular marks that I don't, and I'm kind of sneaking up on these values because I'm trying not to be too heavy handed with it because then that will, um, that's going to flatten things out. If I have a, these thin, then shapes right here, like that's it's not a line, it's a shadow. That's what I'm trying to tell myself is that that's a shadow that's formed in the crease of that upper eyelid as it kind of folds into the eye socket. And let's see. Now, you know, the shape of the the iris here and pupil and I try to establish it's really an oval because we're looking at it three quarters and what's what can be helpful sometimes is to remember that the this right here is a lens it's actually bubbles out slightly it's not smooth over in the sphere it actually kind of bulges out as the lens all right through which the light passes and so there's some there's some form there all right and then if you need to use an eraser to reshape it, you can. And I'm gonna pull out that highlight while I've got it right here. And that's, again, that's overstating the highlight, but I can come back in and refine that. So when I'm refining that highlight, I'm not outlining it, I'm building the darks around it, coming up to that edge. And then look for the subtle variations of light and dark, a little bit darker in the center, let those edges be soft. And there's that kind of triangle right in there that shows the thickness of that lower I mean, the upper eyelid and then actually the lower eyelid too, you can see. Um, let's see. Okay, actually, I think what I need to do now is um, I think I need to get those eyelashes in there because that really defines this edge. And notice how the, the shape of those eyelashes change as you wrap around that sphere. You know, so when we, when we come over on this side, we're kind of looking across it as it wraps around the sphere, and the, the, the angle of those eyelashes changes as we wrap around.
does that work? I guess that works okay. And then right under here, we kind of define that the outside, that outer corner of that lower eyelid so that falls into shadow. And this bottom edge, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant. There's something about that bottom edge, that bottom that lower eyelid that is tricky. Um, I can't quite um, place it. I don't want to, um, I don't want to create a hard line. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out what that is. What am I looking at right here? You see some eyelashes. You see some highlights along that lower ridge. Um, you know, there's thickness to that, that lower eyelid, and there's a little bit of light that catches along that rim, and that's what I'm trying to catch, and it, it gets kind of broken up by the lower eye, uh, eyelashes. So I'll use the blending stump here to kind of shape this a little bit. And I think I, this needs to be a little bit darker right in here and sharper. All right, what do we think? How's that work? Now I want to get the I want to get the eyebrows in here. So I'm going to look at that negative space here. Do a little bit of angle sighting using the side of the pencil. I'm going to kind of just try to align it with the direction of the hairs from the, the eyebrow. So I'm using the side of the pencil to create this rather than the tip. And it just creates a more natural mark. You get these really fine lines, but it feels more natural than when I switch to this tripod grip and if I try to draw them as individual lines. So that's what I really like the overhand grip for that reason. And now with that, with that eyebrow established, I can do a quick check-in over here, look at that space there along the temple um, to, to help me reestablish the hairline. And so to get that hair, I'm uh, kind of using the side of the pencil and I'm kind of pulling away, I'm dragging in and lifting up as I go. I'm trying to pay attention to the um, the, the direction of that hair. So it's right along that edge that's really going to convey the texture of the hair. And let's see, and then here, you can create some really fine lines using the side of the pencil. You know, we often will often think in order to get that control and to get those fine lines, you have to switch to this, this tripod grip like you're writing. Um, but that quickly degrades the tip of the pencil and you find yourself having to sharpen all the time. So use the side of the pencil and you can go for a very long time. All right, so um, I'm gonna kind of work the hair area a little bit. It requires a little less thinking. I kind of exhausted my mind a little bit working on the eyes. And so um, I'm just kind of, I'm gonna kind of bounce around a little bit smooth this out, it's a little distracting right in there. Um, but as I think about the hair, one of the things that can be helpful is to visualize the center line, the central axis along the top of the head, um, and then to see how it wraps around. So I don't want the hair to wrap from here to here. I want it to come up, emerge around the back edge and end up here, right? And then that's gonna help to give it a little bit more kind of form and structure, so. And it's all very subtle, but just kind of changing the direction of your marks can sometimes be sufficient to create that, um, the illusion of texture and then use the texture to create that sense of form. That hairline is really tricky because it's such a soft edge. Okay. All right, now let's go back to, we'll work, down, work our way down to the nose. Here's what I wanna do, actually. I think I wanna sharpen up this edge. I'm gonna see what happens when I use a line along here. If I make it fine enough, hopefully it's not gonna flatten things out. If you have enough variation in a line, you can still create and kind of convey a sense of three-dimensional 
form. All right. All right, thank you, Cynthia. Now, Claudia is saying, to get values, I use a black and white photo. I think that's a really good, a really good tool to use. Um, I kind of, I, we've talked about that a little bit here with um, this series. I, I, I prefer to use a color photograph just for that kind of extra challenge, but um, because I'm, my goal is to, to develop my drawing skills that I, so that I can apply it to my plein air painting. So that's just kind of the, the skill that I need for my own uh, development at this point, but there's nothing, um, nothing wrong at all. We're using a black and white photo. I think it's a really helpful way to, to get at accurate value quickly. All right, let me move down the nose. This is really tricky in here because it's so subtle. There's no real uh, sharp edge there. Um, so what do I want to do? I think what's ultimately going to make that nose work is to focus on the shape of the shadow underneath it. So I'm going to build it. Um, I'm going to build the structure of the nose using the the blending stump here, and really try to visualize the various planes of the nose. Here's that that front edge, then it kind of wraps around, and then you have you know a change in direction the plane uh, uh, as you wrap up around the, the nostrils there. Um, and then, you know, the tip of the nose almost creates kind of like a diamond form here. It, it kind of varies from person to person. That's what makes people unique. It's, um, but let's see. And then I'm going to look at that cast shadow here. The nose is casting a shadow on that upper lip. It's very thin put us a shadow nonetheless. Okay, and now I think if I, see if I sharpen this up. So I'm just doing a quick check-in as I, as I draw this underside of the, the center of the nose here, that central part of the nostril, or the, uh, you know, the underside of the nose there. I just wanted to do a quick check-in with the nostril here and you get a, Kind of a clear shadow here, sharper edge. And then we've got the nostril. So I'm gonna break this down into at least two angles. So you get this general angle here, and then it changes, it's more of a diamond shape. Um, and I'm trying to pay attention to the softness of the edges where it's harder and where it's softer. So it's a little bit softer underneath here, for example. And then I think I just need to make it a little bit larger. It's all very subtle. This is where, you know, a sixteenth of an inch can make a big difference. You know, if you're off by a little bit, it can change the, can change the proportions a bit. So I'm trying to be careful about that. Let me wipe that down. And then I'm going to refine that nostril using the eraser. It's really just a light pressure right in here to refine that edge, but I don't want to, I don't want to erase out a highlight. So that highlight is going to be right in here. Right there on the tip of the nose. And then right in here, the light catches in that corner. So I can reestablish some of this, the highlight along in here. So we, if you remember earlier, I erased out that light, but it got kind of lost, you know, in the haze as the graphite built up a little bit. So it's, we often have to, you know, continually refine and reestablish things that we had um, drawn before. And that's very normal. Let me see. So I just want to kind of sharpen up this. So I'll just use some parallel hatching along that back nostril here. And there's a little bit of a shadow shape right in here that helps to give it a little bit more form. So with these, these hatch marks here, they're, I'm trying to be gentle with them. Um, and so, and I'm you know, kind of 
creating a rocking motion with the pencil. So it's a gentle landing and a gentle lift off. It's not a harsh point and then drag. It's kind of a scooping motion and that will help to um, you know, establish those hatch marks without them kind of popping off the page. And I think what I want to do, since this is a drawing, I can make some artistic decisions. I think I want to define the edge of that nose just a little bit more than what I'm able to see in the reference photo. So I'm going to draw, bring a line down here, it's right up in this area. Let's see how that works. All right. Hello, everybody. All right, now I'm going to work my way down to the mouth. I don't know if I got quite the nose 100%. It feels like it's her a nose, but not her nose, is what we kind of talked about earlier. Um, you know, this is where I, you might continue to play around with it a little bit more, but. Um, what do I need to do? Let me, I, so I, I don't know what I. Some, what I should do right now is actually just set this, let's set the nose aside and I'll come back to it. Um, and, and when I kind of know if I can identify really what's wrong, but I feel like something is off on it now. It's close, but not quite there. And maybe that's all right for the purposes of this drawing. I'm going to sharpen up this back edge here. Um, hello from Brazil. Welcome, Marco. Um, so what do I want to do here? I think what I want to do is I want to start from the center of the mouth and kind of work my way around it um, rather than working from the edge and then trying to build out the form. Um, so I'm going to start here. The lower, the upper eyelid, upper lip is generally in shadow. Um, so I'm going to try to create that form here a little bit. Maybe I need to use the blending stump to do that. Um, and one of the things that can be helpful is to identify where the center of the lip is. You know, in this case, if you, you know, draw a center line down here, we come down the center of the nose, come down here, and then it angles up and down the up, up, along the upper lip and it places the center of her lip right here. And then from there, that might help you to identify the specific shape that you need to draw that lip. Um, and we wrap around into shadow here. So I'm just using these soft circular marks. Um, and then there's this bit of a highlight that's catching along the lip here, and that helps to give it some form. And then what happens? Let's see. I think this is still, the background is darker in value. I can kind of give that a little bit of shape there. I'm going to erase out the light on that cheek. Sorry, if I'm dipping into the shot, I'm trying to stay clear of it. And then that lower lip kind of comes out here. And then this, that's light here versus a dark background. So if I, if I drew that line in, I can kind of feather it out. And then that line forms the value in the background. And now, let's see. So the, the trick with lips, right, is to see how they kind of interlock. Um, and you can see it in her lips, really, it's structured beautifully where you have like this, this pad around the outer edge. You know, we have these, these kind of pads here in the lower lip, and then it, it, we get a, it kind of sinks in a little here. But then that upper lip, we kind of have this, this part that kind of locks into that space. And so you get this inter, interlocking um, relationship between the upper and the lower lips. Um, generally, the upper lip is in shadow just because it, it curls underneath and yet the light is generally coming from above. And so it's a little bit darker here in the upper lip. 
um, it wraps around, it's, it's cylindrical in nature, so um, as we wrap around the head, that kind of falls into shadow. And then the lower lip generally catches more light, and in this case, it's a little bit of shadow here. We get highlights in here, and then we get the cast shadow underneath. Um, and you can see it's just a thin, thin sliver feathers out towards this edge here. It gets a little bit sharper. And now I want to I want to sharpen up this background here, right here against the that lip, and then down to the chin, kind of feathering out away from that edge, so I don't have a dark halo. Now I can kind of start to refine the shape of that chin. And now what I want to do is I'm going to use my blending stump. It's loaded with graphite. So this is going to be a really effective way of creating some of the texture. And it, you know, with the way the lips kind of wrap in, you get a um, you know, bit of a shadow right around, the, right at the edge there, at the center of the mouth. I want to use this to suggest some of the texture here of the lip. And then darken under here. All right, so how's everybody doing? It's a beautiful Wednesday. If you are new, this is Drawing Together. My name's Scott Meyer, and I'm with Artist Network. Um, and if you want to follow along, um, there's the reference images in the description below. And we'd love to see everybody's work, so you can share it at Artist Network when you're done. There's a, a specific show page that's, you'll see it in the description, and it's pinned to the top of this discussion thread. Um, yeah, I'd love to see everybody's work. So just using... I'm just using the blending stump to kind of fill in some of these areas here. I'll have to erase out some of the highlights here. I'm not getting the structure right here. This is starting to get to be a hot mess. But so I'm just going to smooth things out a little bit. Then I'm going to use my eraser to kind of draw with a bit. So if it's getting blotchy, I'm seeing some, some areas in here where it's it's just getting blotchy, um, targeting the light areas to kind of fill in and then we'll smooth it out. Using a circular motion can help. And then let's use the eraser, the fine eraser, to kind of pull out some of the highlights in here. Right in here, there's a... There's a little highlight right in there, and then I want to just sharpen up the corner of the mouth a little bit. And this is a spot where, you know, just the slightest change can completely adjust the, the expression. And that's one of the things that makes portrait drawing so powerful and challenging is, you know, we're finally attuned to uh, the, the subtle changes in a person's expressions, expression. And so when we look at a, a portrait painting or a portrait drawing, um, you know, we, we see it just the slightest squint in it. We, it, it creates a certain feeling or, um, you know, a certain expression that we tap into, we can recognize. May not, we may not be able to define it particularly, but we can will feel it and so um, it can be really challenging to get that just right and, and like this is where things are off just slightly uh, you know I feel like there's a difference between the drawing and the reference but it's so subtle it's really hard to identify what it is it's kind of like in in music or you know when you kind of hear two notes that are close to one another it can be difficult to tell which one's higher which one's lower I remember doing that when tuning a guitar um, you know trying to use the strings it's um, you know you 
you're trying to play two strings that should be the same note and you can't figure out which one needs to go up and which one needs to go down in order for them to, to line up. Um, it happens in, in drawing as well. Um, all right, thank you everybody uh, who's joining in. Um, Mary, I'm glad you're enjoying these. Emmanuel, welcome from Ireland. Um, uh, PJ Lewis saying, my long career as a makeup artist helped so much in my portraits. I feel getting the proportion right is the most important, but I but the prettier I make them, the better they like it. <laughs> nice, that's a good. It's good to it's good to hear. Yeah, definitely. The for, I, I feel the same way about proportions being kind of key, um, and, and perhaps is one of the reasons why I do mostly landscape work is because there's a little bit more forgiving in terms of the proportions. So um, uh, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to here. So what I'm gonna do is. Try to identify the, this edge along here. And there's a reflected light along that bottom edge. Um, where is, so if I come down here, this, there's just a thin indication of that neck. And I, if I bring a plumb line up right through, it connects, it aligns with the left side of this eye um, let's see how that, does that work out okay? And I need to, I'm going to go darker with this background here. This, let's see, I think I need to, I'm starting to see this. This is, um, this is all gonna be very subtle in here. I need to, I'm gonna now adjust kind of the negative space to find the right shape of her chin and get that right angle, because this angle is off now. Um, what am I looking at? That feels more correct. And then this we come up here. And then it's really hard to see in the shadow here. It's hard to see what's happening with that jawline. That's where the neck and the jaw interact. And it's that's a tricky spot. Um, so I'm going to try to play around with this a little bit more. Actually, what I, so now what I need to do is you can see along in here, there's a bit of some of the shadow core. You see that line of termination where we go from light into shadow as you wrap from light here into that shadow underneath the chin. Um, it, you encounter what's called the line of termination um, or the terminator as um, it's also referred to. And so um, that's, that's really kind of a critical path to establish is that is the path of the terminator. It's so, it sounds so, uh, so ominous, but <laughs> hopefully it makes sense. And now I think I can, I can use this to help um, with the highlights along that chin. I want to get the shape of the chin right by getting the shape of the highlight. And that's one of the things that can also be really tricky is getting the, getting the shapes of the highlights right because that can affect the shape of the forms. And so, um, but it's really, can, it can be really tricky because they can often have, they're just soft transitions, so it's hard to determine what the shape of those highlights are. Um, so I'm going to just use the kneaded eraser. I'm gonna just kind of sculpting a little bit with the, uh, with the eraser. Um, so looking back and forth at the reference image, trying to see them as kind of abstract shapes as well, but you know, by now it's starting to feel like a three-dimensional form. 
And so you know, now you can, you can start to really kind of sculpt with it. We kind of talked a little bit about that a bit earlier. I think it's a good analogy. So I think about when I'm when I'm using the eraser, I'm trying to think about cross contour information as well. So, you know, think about you know how the direction of these eraser marks might contribute to the form. That might be too much. I think I'm, that's so subtle in there. I'm not quite sure what I need to do. How's that work? Just kind of experimenting, going back and forth between laying down the graphite, erasing. Laying it down, using my fingers, which I shouldn't be doing, but I don't want to stop to pick up. I have my, my paper towel in this hand and I just don't want to switch it. <laughs> I'm getting kind of lazy. So, uh, Dbald8 is saying, I find that I know something is off in my portraits, but I can't always see it. Yeah, that's, that's, thank you for sharing that. That's, I, that's something that I can connect with as well. And I suspect uh, many other viewers can also identify with it's, gosh, it's, it's the hard part of portraits is, you know, we get down to those fine, fine points and they can make all the difference in the world. Um, so what I'm finding is I want, I want that highlight to have a bit more punch to it. Um, and I can't really do that. I'm going to have to darken the space around it in order to create that that contrast that I'm looking for. So just using that blending stump and just applying a bit more pressure where I need it, kind of feathering it out. Um, PJ Lewis, it's kind of coming back to your comment about being a, um, a makeup artist. That's got to be really a fascinating um, art form and to see how it relates to, to portraiture. You know, I just, I don't probably, yeah, I don't spend nearly that much time really studying faces the way you must. So um, it's kind of a cool... Uh, Cool opportunity there, cool kind of translation between the two skills. So as I'm, as I'm working my way up, I'm trying to think about the planes of the, the head. So as we follow along the temple, for example, this becomes more vertical. We make a slight change and we have this, this section of the forehead. Um, and we have the front of the forehead that, uh, you know, then is, is generally more flat. So I'm just dropping the value in the spaces around the, the highlights there, just so I can create a bit more contrast and that should hopefully bring out the form more. Kind of curious if anybody else has um, kind of training and skills in another area that's kind of tangential, you know, kind of related to the um, kind of traditional fine art that you find helpful in translating the fine art. Fine art is such a kind of a loaded word. All right. Um, Sad potato, something that helps me see what's wrong with the drawing is looking really quickly between the drawing and the reference so that anything moves, changes between the two is, is more noticeable. Yes, that's a really good, um, it's a really good suggestion there. So it's really just kind of moving back and forth until they almost kind of merge as one. Um, that can be a great way. Um, all right, what do I need to do here? So what, now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm just looking at this section here and I'm kind of losing the structure. So what I want to do is I want to find the shadow core. I want to find the, actually the darkest part of the shadow that follows a lot up along her uh, jawline. And we get a little bit of bounce light and then we get to the cast shadow along the neck. And so I want to darken that path here along that shadow core. And I'm using the overhand grip because I want that that side of the pencil, I want those to be that to be a soft transition. 
Um, and then, then I can switch to looking at the neck. So kind of working both, both the, that shadow core here and then the neck to find that, that line, that transition between the jaw and the neck. It's so subtle. There's just kind of a sharper edge right in here. So I haven't gone in and erased out this bounce light. I'm trying to establish that by darkening the areas around it first. And then if it's still too dark, I can erase that out. But one of the things that um, I've found that um, some students struggle with, and this is something I struggled with for, for a long time, is overstating the, uh, the bounce light in the shadow area. Just making that light too you know, punchy, too much contrast. Um, we want it to, we really want that to fall into shadow. You don't want to, you don't want to confuse that bounce light for a highlight. And so, like I said, I find it often more effective to darken the space around it than anything. Emmanuel Gutson, um, yes, Bugaro, another great portrait artist. So now I'm just looking at, um, there's some creases along the neck that are very subtle, but will be helpful in establishing the volume of the neck, making it really feel rounded. Yeah, I'm kind of curious, what other artists everybody kind of looks to? Um, you know, I kind of have, my influences have varied over the years. Um, various landscape artists, as well as Sargent. Um, really been looking a lot at the work of the, the artists who did the, the, the backgrounds, the backdrops for the, the dioramas in the Natural History Museum in New York. Um, James Perry Wilson in particular, and their Sargent. Really love the work of Neil Welliver, but then also Cezanne. Um, Angra, Degas, you know, there's all sorts. Um, Jan is saying, I usually do these from live sitters. Way to go. That's, that's tricky. It's always the best. If you can work from life, that is the best. You're going to learn so much from that. We don't really have that opportunity here, but let me finish reading what Jan says. I usually get a good likeness unless I have a moving target, an additional challenge. Yikes. That is, that is a challenge. Way to go. All right, so I'm just evaluating now to see if it has has a structure that I want. Um, the hairline seems to be a little off. I can kind of massage this a little bit. So I'm just using the side of the pencil. Um, trying to pay attention to the direction of the marks and then trying to capture the overall, uh, the overall form. It's no real clear line kind of defining the edge, which is what makes this hairline so diff difficult. I think what I want to do is just kind of sharpen up the edges in a few areas Yeah, there's, there's subtle things that are off. What is off right here? Uh, I think I need to deepen the shadow right in here. Kind of slim her, slim her down a little bit. Come in on the cheekbones. Well, this is really tricky now. Now we're getting into the subtlety. So, but we're on, whoa, my gosh, we're over two hours right now. So I should probably kind of call it for soon. And I don't know how much more I can really get done. Um, that's going to be noticeably different, you know, but hopefully this um, gives you a little bit of practice working with the portrait. Um, you know, we, so we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. 
I for the life of me can't remember what we're doing next week. My brain is kind of shot right now. So, um, but I, you know, each week I choose just a different subject. Something we just get together, we draw, share our experiences. I'd love to see your work. So um, find the link in the description or at the top of the chat here, and you'll go to the show page where you can share your work. Um, I really appreciate everybody's time and your your guidance throughout this process. I've been, had a lot of good kind of suggestions, commentary. Um, um, let's see. Emmanuel Scott Waddell, yeah, he's a the great um, artist as well. Emmanuel is sharing. Um, oh, Kathy, you know Neil Welliver's work too. I, he's another Mainer. He, he, he painted not far from where I grew up. And um, I just... Uh, for whatever reason really gets me his use of color and so um, I dig it um, and then Jane Jackson will there be a recording yes this will be recorded so as soon as this is done it'll post it takes a little while for the chats to chat to come up so some people like to refer to the chat later um, and see what people are commenting on and um, and that will show up, but all the recordings are there. If you go to Artist Network, you can find the Drawing Together page. Holy smokes. That was a dark mark there. <laughs> um, but you can go to Artist Network, and you can find the Drawing Together page um, that will have all the episodes. We're on, what, 79 or so. We've got a lot of episodes um, that you can look at. Um, you don't have to go through an order. They're just, you know, each week's its own thing. And... Um, yeah, it's just all about challenging ourselves with new subjects, different media, things like that. Um, excellent. Well, thank you all. I see a lot of a lot of excellent artists, inspirations. Uh, yeah, Vermeer. I'm glad other people have known Neil Welliver's work. Um, all right. Well, I really appreciate all the comments, all the help. I'm glad you could all join me. I got to... Um, got to call it a day. I might continue to work on this and I'll post it on the, uh, the drawing together page for this, this episode. So you can all see it if you want. So check that out. So I'll, I'll keep kind of tweaking this and we'll share it, but I really appreciate you all being here. Thank you for all the positive comments and the help.